Okay, welcome to the Filipino Bar Association of Northern California's annual judiciary panel, the first. My name is Natalie Garcia Lashinsky, and I'm the co director of FBANK's Professional Development Committee. It is my privilege to welcome this incredible panel of trailblazers who are here today to share their legacy and career as Filipino Americans serving on the bench. Joining us today, we have Honorable Patrick Bumate. Prior to joining the bench, Judge Bumate served in various roles at the U.S. Department of Justice, and he later served as an assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of California in the San Diego office. Judge Bumate was nominated in 2019 by President Trump and subsequently confirmed to serve as a U.S. Circuit Judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He is the first Filipino American to serve as a federal appellate judge. Next, we have Honorable Lillian Lim. Prior to joining the court, Judge Lim previously worked as a Deputy Attorney General for California's Department of Justice, part of which she spent working in the Medi-Cal Fraud Unit. In 1986, she was appointed to the Municipal Court in San Diego and later, su later succeeded to the San Diego County, County Superior Court bench. She retired in 2007 and continued to serve until March of 2012 as a visiting judge in courts throughout California. She is the first Filipina American judge in the United States. Next, we have Honorable Benjamin Reyes II. Prior to joining the court, Judge Reyes spent most of his career at Myers Nave, where he managed the public agency practice. Judge Reyes was appointed to the Contra Costa County Superior Court in 2017, and he is the first Filipino American judge on the Contra Costa County bench. Next, we have Judge, um, Honorable Lorna Schofield. Prior to joining the court, Judge Schofield was a partner in the law firm Zeppa Voice and Plimpton in New York City in their litigation practice where she focused on complex commercial matters. Judge Schofield was nominated in 2012 by President Obama and was subsequently confirmed to serve as a U.S. District Court judge in the Southern District of New York. Judge Schofield is the first Filipino American to serve as an Article III federal judge. And finally, it is my privilege to welcome our moderator today, David Mesa. David is a partner at Fisher Broyles in the Palo Alto office, where he is an experienced litigator representing clients in pharmaceutical, med pharmaceutical medical device, automobile, and consumer product industries. He is a past FBank president and past president of the National Filipino American Lawyers Association. Before I turn this over to David, time permitting, we will have a Q&A session. So please type any questions in the Q&A feature below. David? Thanks for having me, Natalie. Good afternoon, your honors. And good morning to you, uh, Judge Lim. You're in Hawaii, so you've got the best view out of all of us. <laughs> I am honored to be here today and privileged to be in the presence of such excellence so any firsts, we've got the first Filipino American judge in the United States, in the history of the United States. The first Filipino American Article III judge, the first Filipino American Federal Appeals judge, the first Filipino American judge in Contra Costa County. So many firsts and I'm privileged to be here today and thank you for being here today. Your stories, are stories of pure professional excellence and leadership in our community. And we wanna share it with our members. We wanna hopefully give them the tools to help them navigate the mystery of becoming a judge, because as you guys know, this is a very mysterious process and we are hopefully helping to provide resources to help uncover the mystery. As we hear your stories, we can help our Filipino American lawyer community draw on your life experiences and hopefully some folks participating today on the Zoom can use what they have learned from you to become judges themselves someday. So this is for me a full circle because almost 10 years ago, I hosted the F-Bank Judiciary Panel with my old firm where we had F-Bank's founding trailblazer judges, Judge Ron Kitache of the San Francisco Superior Court, who was our first, our very first uh, Filipino American judge and for a very long time, the only Filipino American judge in the Bay Area until Judge Reyes joined him, and administrative law judge Eleanor Nisperos, who was F Bank's founding president. Judge Kita Che and Judge Nisperos, along with our other founding members, have paved the way for F Bank for these past four decades. And for that, we remain extremely grateful. Now, in the past 10 years, we welcome the three of four of you 
We celebrated so many new firsts and we are extremely grateful for the accomplishments of this panel of trailblazers from across the state and across the country. So thank you. We're honored for you to be here today. So before I jump into the questions, I wanted to give a brief disclaimer to the audience. The Code of Judicial Ethics places many limitations on what judges can say publicly. It's a list of prohibited topics. The main ones are commenting on anything political, on people, events, or expressing an opinion regarding issues that may come before them. So now that we've got the business out of the way, let's get right into it. Uh, I wanted to start with each of your origins stories. Uh, before you each don the robe, you were all successful, high-performing practicing attorneys. And before that, at some point, you made the life-changing decision to become a lawyer. So let's go back to that. Uh, why did you choose to become a lawyer? And why don't we go by year of appointment? So we'll start with Judge Lim, go to Judge Schofield, then go to Judge Reyes, and then we'll end up with Judge Bumate. So Judge Lim. Uh, I uh, always wanted to be useful uh, and to be a lawyer. Uh, a lawyer is to be a useful uh, person. Uh, and in my time, uh, you have to remember, uh, my dad immigrated in the 1920s. My mom came shortly after uh, World War II. We didn't have uh, many uh, career choices that people thought uh, our, our people uh, could accomplish. So if you were reasonably bright, you were steered towards uh, the sciences and math. Uh, but for me, I didn't think I could be as useful <laughs> as a uh, scientist or a mathematician or a doctor because I didn't think that's where my talents lay and I wanted to be useful. So I decided understanding, I didn't really know the range of choices I might have. You know, it was doctor, lawyer, rich man, poor man. It was uh, a beggar man, thief, you know, among all those, I thought, well, uh, lawyer. And I would also say, uh, coming out of undergraduate school, I had been accepted uh, to political science at UC Berkeley. And so I had to decide, do I want a career in academics or did I wanna do something uh, else that uh, met a broader community? Uh, my then husband, Peter Kwan, was going to go to law school and I decided to go along with him. So that's how I started. So shall I just go ahead? I will, uh, I'll tell you what my mother wanted. My mother said, Lorna, why don't you become Barbara Walters? And I said, what? And she said, you know, be like a famous person on television who does the news. And I said, I don't think you can go to school to become a famous person on television who does the news. I don't, I don't think I can do that. Um, but when I was in high school, I was on the debate team and I acted in community theater and I didn't know any lawyers. Uh, I'd never encountered a lawyer, but I watched them on television and they seemed to have this sort of performers larger than life existence. And I thought, wow, that seems really fun. And like maybe something I could do that's a little bit easier to do than be Barbara Walters. So I, that, that was my thought when I was uh, in high school. And then I went to college and like Judge Lim, I was faced with sort of a choice of whether to go into an academic field or whether to go to law school. And as it turned out, I found myself in my first year of graduate school in comparative literature. And uh, as some of you know, my mother had died while I was in college and my father was kind of out of the picture and I was on my own and I really needed to support myself. And it just seemed to me that a more practical choice uh, was the law. I'd love to say, oh, I, you know, I love the law and I was gonna do it from the moment I was born. But that wasn't me. I didn't really know enough about it to be able to say anything like that. But um, it seemed to me that it was a life uh, 
that would support me and a life, as Judge Lim said, of being useful. So that was where I went. All right, uh, so um, <clears throat> thank you everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, I think many of you have heard this story about why I chose to be a lawyer. It was actually plan B for me. Uh, the call to service is very strong in my family. My father had spent 30 years in the United States Navy and I always thought that I would follow in his footsteps. Uh, when I applied to college after, uh, out of high school, I was actually accepted to two of the service academies, to the United States Naval Academy and to uh, West Point. And I thought that I wanted to be a Navy pilot, but I wear these things and uh, was not qualified for the uh, pilot program. And I didn't think that uh, West Point was the appropriate culture for me. Um, I was then soon thereafter also accepted to the University of California at Berkeley on a, a ROTC scholarship. So I uh, enrolled at Cal and um, it was my goal to uh, always be a soldier. So uh, when I was uh, um, in, in, at college, I enrolled in the Army ROTC program and uh, actually earned a regular Army commission as an infantry officer and a combat engineer. And uh, I, at the time, just like many 21 year old, uh, I was young and invincible. And during an airborne training parachute exercise, I actually injured myself, injured both my ankles and uh, left the army as a result of that uh, uh, injury. And I applied for and attended law school. So law school is actually part B for me, but I, I uh, followed my initial calling to duty and devoted my career in law towards the service of governmental entities. So that's sort of my origin story of how I became a lawyer ultimately. Great. Uh, so I came from one of those Filipino families where uh, the medical profession is, is very important and involved. So my, my parent, both my parents were medical doctors. My grandfather is a medical doctor. I've got five or six uh, titas and titos that are doctors and, and nurses. My sister is a doctor. So I grew up thinking I'm gonna join the family uh, career and become a doctor. Uh, but it wasn't until about uh, middle school, like sixth, seventh, eighth grade, where I decided, uh, I learned, I got onto student government and I realized that I loved service, public service, working with people and, and dealing with public policy issues. And so that led me on that trajectory to become the black sheep of the family and go towards law school. And, and uh, just because of that love of, of public policy, public service, and it was just the most natural fit for me. And, and it's been great ever since. Great. It sounds like we had a lot of shared experiences where parents wanted us to be doctors, <laughs> engineers, or scientists, mathematicians. Um, and it sounds like we all decided to, you know, do something useful and provide some public service and become lawyers. So now we know sort of why you wanted to become a lawyer. Um, Want to go talk about a bit about your path to the bench. Uh, we can go in reverse order on this um, on this question. We'll start with Judge Bumate and end up with Judge Lamb, but maybe address a few of the questions. What did you do before becoming a judge? What inspired you to choose a path to the bench? Uh, were the people around you surprised by the change in your career path? You can address one or a few of those questions in your response. Thanks. Okay, great. So I spent the bulk of my career as a Department of Justice attorney. Um, and it was a relatively recent uh, thought in my head that I, I would want to be a, a judge. If you asked me in law school, I definitely would not have said I would have, I, I wanted to be a judge. If you asked me 10 years ago, I definitely would not have said I wanted to be a judge. It was only about five years ago uh, when I was a prosecutor here in San Diego. I just remember being in court and seeing the great work that judges get to do. And it's the kernel uh, of came into my head. Well, maybe I would want to do this one day and how amazing it would be to do that. But I didn't really do anything to pursue that, uh, that goal. Um, so until I, I eventually uh, was asked to do a detail at the, in Maine Justice in Washington, DC, working for the Deputy Attorney General. And a friend of mine worked, who worked at the Department of Justice and said to me, you know, they're interviewing people for the Ninth Circuit. Do you want to be considered? I'm like, sure, there, there's just no way I'm ever going to get that. I just thought it'd be a pie in the sky thing. And I thought it'd be an amazing opportunity just to be interviewed or considered um, for the position. And then I thought, well, you know, maybe if I do well enough in that interview, 
they would consider me for a district court position in San Diego, which is uh, which was the goal that I thought was attainable for me. Uh, and uh, so uh, it was ex extremely fortuitous. I went through the interview process and I was shocked to find out uh, that I was one of the finalists and considered uh, made it to the final rounds. And, you know, the funny thing is I did, uh, my, my family was very shocked because I actually didn't tell anyone that I was being considered and being vetted uh, for the judgeship because I just, just never thought it was ever gonna happen and just didn't feel real to me. And so I didn't wanna let my parents know, you know, that I'm on this, you know, that I might be able to get this and then not do it. So uh, they, 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 got a, they got a call about it very, very, very late in the process. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, David. So my my path to the bench um, also had a unique trajectory. I had practiced law for 24 years and built a, a public agency practice that I was very proud of. I was an equity shareholder in a reputable California public agency law firm, and I really did enjoy my practice. So I was one of those attorneys who actually went to work every morning thinking, gee, I get to go to work today. And I work with a really amazing colleagues and, and very amazing clients. So I was at the point in my career where I was able to work on only projects that I wanted to work on. And I enjoyed working with clients and public agencies who, who actually sought me out. So my practice was interesting, it was enjoyable. It provided me with a sense of community and a, a sense of public service. And um, quite frankly, was financially prosperous. So I wasn't interested in giving that up at all, but. Two years before my appointment, I was approached by several judges, including Judge Keita Chai and other judges in, in Alameda County, uh, a former partner of mine who became a judge, and uh, lawyers who are my friends, including uh, David Mesa here. And I was also approached by several elected officials, including uh, a good friend of mine, Assembly Member Rob Bonta, and people whom I respected who are active community leaders. And uh, over the next two years, they regularly worked on me to submit an application for judicial appointment. Um, I didn't think I had the appropriate credentials to be a judge because my practice was not litigation heavy. My cases tend to resolve through alternative dispute resolution by statute. And the cases that I did end up litigating usually went before the court of appeal. Uh, and there was also no financial incentive for me to um, significantly reduce my income because I had two children who are about to enter college. But I submitted an application with very, very low expectations. And much to my surprise with FBank and Enfala support, as well as support from the API community and bar associations, um, I was interviewed by the Contra Costa Bar Association three months after submitting my application. And then I got my Jenny interview three months after submitting my application. And then three months after that, I was interviewed by uh, Justice Groban, who is the gubernatorial appointment secretary for uh, Governor Brown. And three months after my interview with uh, Governor Brown, I was appointed to the bench. So uh, my, my appointment process actually took approximately nine months. So this May, it'll be my fourth year anniversary. Uh, it's an honor to serve on the bench and uh, to represent the community as a member of the judiciary. In answer to your final question, uh, David, were the people around you surprised by the change in your career path? Um, quite frankly, I think my partners uh, came up to me and said, you know, uh, this is a very honorable position for you and you, you will respect the firm very well, but um, I have to tell you, you're probably making one of the worst financial decisions in your career. <laughs> um, I certainly don't regret the appointment. I'm, you know, uh, very, very proud to uh, serve on the bench and uh, thank you very much, F. Bank, for your support. Before moving on to Judge Lim, I just wanted to comment a bit on Judge Reyes's appointment because at the time, uh, we only had one Filipino American judge in the nine Bay Area counties, and that was Judge Tita Che. And from 1983 up until Judge Reyes's appointment, we had only had one Filipino American judge. So, Judge Reyes, thank you so much for stepping up and putting your name in the pipeline and for being the second Filipino American judge in the Bay Area and the first Filipino American judge in Contra Costa County. That's a huge accomplishment. Thank you. Judge Lynn? Uh, while we're uh, on that topic, I, I would wanna mention uh, Red Rakana out of the Los Angeles Superior Court, whose son now uh, is a, a judge. And uh, he, uh, I think at our first annual judges meeting statewide, 
uh, he made a point of uh, welcoming uh, me to the bench. So I just say uh, kudos to him. Uh, he certainly was supportive of uh, all our Asian and Filipino uh, lawyers and certainly supportive of me. Now I was inspired kind of in historical sequence by my uh, 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 advisor uh, as an undergraduate at Brown University. Uh, he was Professor Gao Ying Mao in political science. And he's the one who first introduced me to the idea, oh, you know, uh, Asians, Filipinos, they can be communicators, they can be leaders. Uh, they don't have to be uh, uh, isolated in professions where they don't talk, they don't communicate, they don't lead. Uh, so it's my uh, first inspiration. Uh, my uh, second inspiration, uh, of course, was uh, Peter Kwan, who uh, we were fond of saying, uh, uh, being a lawyer and then later being a judge was a passport to community service. People would welcome you. If you came to them, even with good intentions, but without that skill set, you know, you were not uh, as welcome to join uh, in community service. Uh, so Peter was certainly an inspiration. And then uh, lastly was uh, the Filipino American community. But what happened uh, in my specific case, uh, a name of another Asian American, not a Filipino, was being circulated. Uh, among the San Diego community. And then uh, people came to me and said, who is this guy, right? And then, and then they said, why don't you apply? Because at least we know you and uh, uh, we know that um, you certainly uh, represent the diversity of all our uh, communities. And so they were certainly an inspiration. And I have to say, when I received the call from uh, Marvin Baxter, the appointment secretary that I was appointed, he, he uh, made a special point of saying, uh, there are a lot of good people in the Asian and Filipino American communities who uh, support your application. And we just wanted you to know that. So that's my story. <laughs> that's great. Did you, okay. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll chime in with, uh, where I was before, I, I, I actually spent 30 years in private practice, well, 30 years being a lawyer before I became a judge. Um, 26 of those were in big law and four years I spent as a federal prosecutor uh, in the Southern District of New York. And, um, I, you know, after 30 years, I felt like I'd had a great career, a great time, and it was time to retire or do something else because I, I had I had done what I needed to do as a lawyer. And frankly, you know, being in big law, you get a little bit burnout after a long time. So um, so I'll just I'll just say that you know the thought occurred to me of possibly being a judge. I was encouraged uh, at a dinner, it was actually a bar association dinner where I was sitting next to uh, a, as it happens, an Asian American woman who said, Lorna, you really should think about being a judge. And she said, I happen to know the person who is in charge of uh, Senator Schumer's uh, committee. And uh, I can certainly tell her that you're interested and she can give you the information and you can put in an application. And I thought, well, okay, I guess I can try that. And, you know, we'll see what happens. But I really, I, I really honestly did not think it would happen. And I just, you know, the whole idea David, you talked about, you know, what was your path? It, I mean, it wasn't really a path. It, it's really like just being hit by lightning because, you know, it's so, you know, the word that that Judge Bumade used was, uh, you know, uh, fortuity. But it, I mean, that was the word I would have used too. It was completely fortuitous. I mean, there's so many, there are thousands of lawyers in this country who are qualified uh, and who are certainly more connected than I am. And, you know, it was so much just a matter of being in the right place at the right time. And, you know, I am very grateful for that and honored, but it's, you know, it's not because of any greatness of mine. I, I really attribute it to good fortune and good luck. Um, and, and, you know, in terms of being a judge in public service, I had been in public service prosecutor. 
I really enjoyed that. You know, I felt like I'd been working hard, uh, as one friend put it, making the world safe for big corporations. I, you know, I'd done that enough. And so it was time to do something else. Um, were people surprised? I think only, uh, only a little bit, because I think, you know, I, I made it pretty well known that I was, it was time for me to retire. And I honestly would have retired if I hadn't become a judge. Now, of course, this is, you know, 20 times more work than uh, any of you probably could imagine, but it's a, you know, it's a wonderful and fulfilling job. Okay. Joe Schofield, and I understand that when you applied and submitted your name, it was before INFALA had been established and before the INFALA Judiciary Committee had been established. And I understand that NAPABA uh, helped support your application through the vetting process. Um, so I'll open this up to the group and to you, Judge Schofield. Uh, what role did community organizations and bar associations play in your career as a lawyer and later in supporting your application for judge? Um, you must know the answer to this since you asked me this question. <laughs> but so what what role did, so just to tell you a little bit about my background, you know, my mother died when I was 20. She was my connection to the Philippines and Filipino culture. I was from a little town in Indiana and I don't think I saw another Filipino for decades. Um, and so when I was being considered, I think President Schumer or Senator Schumer's office was interested. They want, they were thinking about putting my name forward to President Obama. And they said, well, what kind of support do you have from Filipino community organizations? And I thought, you know, I wouldn't even know where to find a Filipino community organization. And, um, and so I said, you know, really none. And Napaba was amazing. I mean, I don't know if all of you have had this experience too, but the, the folks there who were, who were really so instrumental in I think getting so many Asian American Obama appointees, um, they, they got on it and they found Filipino community organizations and said, you know, will you support this woman? And I, you know, I've said it before, but I think the, the toughest interview I had throughout this whole process was talking to some senior person in one of these organizations. And he said to me, he said, you know, I don't know you, what have you ever done for us? And why should I do anything for you? I mean, it was very blunt and almost precisely those words. And, you know, I, I, I was taken aback because I mean, you know, the answer is what have I ever done for you? I, you know, honestly, I had no connection. So, um, so what I said was, you know, I said, I, I haven't done anything, but I would be so honored if I got this position. And if I did, you know, I would do whatever I could to help support the Filipino community and Filipino lawyers um, to the extent I can with all the limitations there are on judges. And so I've, I've tried to do that and I've remembered that and they got behind me, they supported me. And, you know, he basically said after all that, well, you're the only person they're putting forward. You're the only Filipino. So I guess we'll support you. I think you've been sort of the shining example uh, of the torchbearer for the Filipino American community. I remember right after you were appointed, I saw you speak at the PABA Gala and then you were at the NAPABA uh, convention in San Diego. And then I saw you, uh, you opened up your chambers and you gave us a tour of the Southern District of New York. Uh, we were able to hold our mid-year leadership summit in SDNY because of you. So thank you, Jessica, if you would really appreciate that. You're, you're very welcome. And you know, as I said, it's part of what the debt I owe. And so I wanted to open it up to the group. Um, how, how did your Filipino upbringing influence your identity in your legal career? I guess I, I can um, answer this one, uh, David. Uh, I'm sure others will follow too, but um, part of my cultural upbringing is relevant to my legal career. Uh, my, my, my parents, like all good Filipino parents, embrace the concept of respect for your elders. Um, both my parents embrace the values of hard work and industry. And you know, both my parents often work two jobs at a time to support our family of six on a very modest Navy salary. So I, you know, I'm very mindful of people who are similarly situated when they uh, uh, 
when they either appeared as clients or uh, what, when as city attorney, I had to um, advocate for, uh, you know, for on behalf of the city for people who were less fortunate and who deserved governmental services. I, I now also try to report, uh, reinforce these values um, as I grew as an attorney and now as a judge. And I, um, I, I sort of still value the, uh, um, the concepts of hard work, industry, and respect. And I try to embody that in, um, in how I run my bench. So it's a brief answer to your question. Uh, well, I, I agree with Judge Mumutai, but I, I, what I wanted to say is, you know, our people, our, our culture, we're a, a loving, passionate, sharing, empathetic, uh, culturally, uh, eth uh, our ethnicity, our history is like that. And when we bring that perspective uh, to the bench, I think we make a, uh, a ordinarily very intimidating place feel like a safer place so that the, even the lawyers and the participants can feel uh, we will listen uh, to them. And that's really what people wanna know. Will you listen to them? And I think culturally uh, we bring that uh, to the bench. And I think my court clerk is listening to this panel. so. I want to remind her if she doesn't remember, it was my practice when, because San Diego is one of the um, communities with the highest density of, of Filipino uh, ethnic people outside the Philippines in San Diego. So very often my juries would have Filipino Americans. And I would make a point to let them know, I mean, in front of the jury panel, that I was also a Filipino American. And I could see that they uh, would be physically, visibly proud uh, of that connection. And I think it also uh, served, certainly in my time, to educate the other uh, jury panel members that uh, Asians, that Filipinos, uh, we uh, fill so many uh, uh, roles and we bring that perspective to the legal system and to fact finding. Uh, so I will close by saying aloha Annette and I hope you're watching. <laughs> I wanna echo everything that Judge Lim said. You know, I, I, I practice as a prosecutor in, in San Diego as well. And I always felt a special pride uh, you know, when I was prosecuting in a trial and I'd see Filipino jurors and you know, it was just a nice stand, uh, being able to stand up in front of them. Just felt made me very prideful to be part of the community. Uh, and and I I guess that's what I would take to me to the bench as part of my Philippine identity is you know I we all know what it's like to be a minority to feel not listened to to be not as feel like we're not as valued as others uh, in the room. So for me as a as a Filipino as a judge, I I make sure that every party, every position, every person feels like they're getting all the attention they, they deserve and that every position is well considered and respected. And, and that's an important thing, uh, part that I think that be of my Filipino identity that brings that I bring to the bench. And I also wanna echo what Judge Schofield said, Enfala and Napava have been so amazing to me uh, through my nomination process. I'm so thankful to, to, to David and the organizations and, and F Bank uh, without your support, I don't think I would have made it uh, as well. That's great. And Judge Bumate, you, you've been paying it forward. I think you've sworn in pretty much every gal that <laughs> <laughs> you're commissioned back in December of 2019. Exactly. I'm, ha I'm happy to do it. Keep, keep on coming. Keep on sending the invitations. <laughs> Uh, so just talking a bit about diversity and thinking about our numbers in the United States, and this is more so for the folks that are watching and our audience members, when we think about Filipinos in the United States, the estimates show that we've got about 4 million plus Filipinos of the 330 million people estimated in the United States. So that's about 1.2% of the U.S. population. And in California, there's estimated more than 
1.7 million Filipinos of the 40 million or so Californians, which puts us at about four and a quarter percent of the population in California. So it helps me to put things into perspective to know that Judge Lim, you breaking those barriers 35 years ago in 1986 as the first Filipino American judge was a huge accomplishment. And Judge Schofield in 2012, you becoming the first Article III judge, one of 673 of the district courts, that was a huge accomplishment. And you, Judge Bumate, you being the one of 179 appellate judges, that was a huge accomplishment. And you, Judge Reyes, in the Bay Area, I believe it's your, your two of 310 plus Bay Area judges that are Filipino American. So these accomplishments, we really do appreciate all that you have done. Um, what advice do you have for those who are interested in becoming a judge? And I'll just open it up to the floor. Uh, I, I, I guess I'll start. I would say one, you know, as Judge Scofield said, it, it's 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 about fortuity, and so you, what you need to do is be prepared to capitalize on that opportunity. So that means making sure that you have honed all your skills as a lawyer, and you know, gotten in as many trials as you can, argued as many cases as you can, uh, and so that when when the lightning strikes, you're ready uh, to show that you you are qualified and ready to serve, and. And for me personally, and if you look at a lot of other recent judicial nominees, uh, public service has been uh, one of the great areas that the, the, the president has tapped uh, to, to serve on the bench. So if, if you are really interested in the bench, I, I highly encourage uh, serving as a federal prosecutor or even on, or uh, you know, a federal defender. Uh, and it's, it's just great, great work uh, in public service. Maybe I'll, I'll add my two cents to that. The, before I was a judge, I served on the ABA committee that vets uh, federal judicial nominees. And for each one, we talked to maybe 60 people individually, uh, took notes, and they included both people who the candidate had identified to us, as well as adversaries and other people you could just find by doing a little bit of research. And what I learned from that is that it's very important to act um, civilly and with integrity all the time. Um, and even when you're angry at an adversary, not to make it personal because all those people are people who are gonna get phone calls when you're being considered for a judgeship. Uh, and I don't mean to be so cynical. I don't mean those are the only reasons that you that you should act with integrity and honesty and civility. But you know, it's certainly something that helps motivate you and keep it in the back of your mind because um, you know those professional relationships are something that that people pay a lot of attention to when they're looking at the suitability of a candidate and your temperament and your integrity and your just your professional reputation, personal reputation, are as important as anything else. Um, I will chime in here. I, I will certainly echo what Judge Bumate and uh, Judge Schofield had mentioned about, um, about the uh, uh, networking and uh, having impeccable integrity. Uh, I would like to add that you need to strive to become an excellent lawyer, aspire to be the go-to lawyer in your field and someone whose work and reputation is respected. Um, in addition to developing a reputation for having impeccable integrity, uh, I, you know, I've, I've met the three gubernatorial secretaries here in California, starting with Justice Groban, who interviewed me, Justice Jenkins, who's now on the Supreme Court, and most recently, Mr. Uh, Suspides, and they have each stressed the value of uh, humility. So it's important to be humble. And, uh, you know, sometimes you, uh, you, you encounter that arrogant attorney once in a while. Um, in, in my case, more often than not, probably on, on a weekly basis here in my courtroom. But uh, you need to uh, espouse the value of humility because that's very important in, uh, in the judiciary. Um, serve the community and develop a genuine interest in serving beyond the legal community. Uh, I, in, in my own career path, I've served on three nonprofit organizations whose missions I, I genuinely supported and who provided community service outside of the uh, legal community. 
Uh, and I do stress the value of working on your networks. Um, David had mentioned before uh, the, the role that uh, the bar associations have played. This is my 32nd year as a member in F Bank. I sit on the advisory board and uh, I was humbled and privileged to receive and fall as uh, uh, endorsement for when I uh, had my application in. I think I was probably one of the first judicial officers who sought um, endorsement by Infala, who at the time was a fledgling organization. And I'm proud to have been able to receive support of the Asian American Bar Association here in San Francisco, the Asian Pacific um, Legislators Caucus in the state of California, uh, PABA down in Los Angeles, uh, and, uh, and a number of other uh, groups, including the Bar Association. So it's very important to, uh, to develop the network and uh, you know, make sure that uh, you uh, and your reputation is well known throughout the legal community. Judge Lynn. I don't have much to add other than saying the idea of becoming a, a judge, maybe you should just put that at the back of your mind. And just like everyone has said, be the best, best law student you can be, uh, the best lawyer you can be, the best person. Uh, and in the end, if you decide to apply for a judge, that um, uh, crowd of friends, uh, and organizations you've worked with will come and support you. Uh, but just be the best person and whether you become a judge or not, uh, you're going to benefit uh, by uh, being a good lawyer and a good person. That's great advice. So build a very strong professional reputation, have high integrity, build a great network and be the best that you can be regardless of what type of law you practice. That's great advice. Um, so I, I wanted to move a bit to uh, your role as judge now and wanted to get some advice for our, practice, our practicing lawyers out there. Um, and to the extent that this stays within the judicial canons and doesn't go beyond the lines of uh, what you're uh, allowed to talk about, what, what is one of your biggest pet peeves on the bench? Yes, Lynn? I would say as a lawyer, uh, stop and think before you speak. Just, there's no need to fill the silence uh, with uh, advocacy if you're not focused on your audience, either the jury or the judge or both. Uh, so stop, don't be afraid to stop and think and then speak. Uh, I often, uh, back in the old days, which I'm sure is still true now, the lawyers would be going at each other and I'm just watching the show. And I'll say, stop, just stop, stop and think and then give me something useful. My, mine's easy, um, to, at least to comply with, and that is read the rules. Most judges have their individual rules, and then there are the court's local rules, in addition to whatever other rules there may be. You really need to read them, um, and that is a pet peeve. You know, most judges or most litigants do, and that's great, but some don't, and it's just so frustrating because, you know, they'll end up doing something they shouldn't be doing, or they'll call chambers and say, what do I do about this or that or the other? And the answer is just read the rules. Um, from, from my perspective, um, I, I think one of my biggest pet peeves, uh, and I do appreciate attorneys who are zealous advocates on behalf of their client, but not everything is a, uh, a drag down fight. Um, when you come to court, be prepared to acknowledge a weak argument if you do have one, then be prepared to uh, concede a weak argument. Uh, you don't have to, uh, to, to advocate to the point where you lose your credibility by uh, thinking that all of your points are strong. Um, so the attorney that, that knows how to recognize 
their, um, their issues and knows how to advocate on behalf of their client uh, understands that not every case is the strongest case that they're bringing to the court. Yeah, I would agree with Judge Lim on that. My biggest pet peeve is when an attorney doesn't answer the question. Instead of uh, grappling with a difficult issue, maybe making a concession, the uh, attorney will bob and weave. And, and it's very obvious to, to those of us on the court when, when an attorney is just not answering a question directly. And uh, that it, it, it's frustrating. Obviously, it's, we're going to the heart, heart of the matter or a difficult question. You be able, need to be able to answer it directly without bobbing and weaving, which you see very often, um, at least on, on appeals. Thanks for that. I was taking very good notes on all, on all those pet peeves. <laughs> uh, would you share a story or incident where your background as a Filipino or Filipina was a barrier or a challenge in your career, whether it was as a lawyer or as a judge? I'm happy to do this um, I, because I, I've said this many times before. So those uh, particularly in Northern California is who has heard this story before. I, I apologize for repeating it, but um, in, uh, I was appointed in 2017 and uh, right after uh, my appointment, I, I had asked for a 90 day uh, window to be able to transition my practice. So I was already appointed, but I had not taken my oath yet. And uh, in some of my downtime, I ended up going to Contra Costa to observe a criminal calendar because I knew that my first assignment was going to be criminal. So I sat in the, uh, the back of an arraignment courtroom where typically a lot of the, uh, the defendants would sit and to observe one of my colleagues call a calendar. And towards the end of the calendar, um, a, um, uh, a young district attorney came up to me and said, um, excuse me, uh, what case are you here for? And do you know who your public defender is? So this is already after I've been appointed. So uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the young DA whose name I won't um, repeat or mention because that DA uh, often comes into the court um, uh, made the assumption that uh, you know, I, was a, I was a criminal defendant in the case, even though I was well-dressed and, you know, and looked professional from, from a most objective perspectives. Uh, my colleague, Joni, Judge Joni Hiramoto, who saw what was going on at the time, basically um, said, you know, excuse me, everyone, I'd like to make an announcement. I'd like to introduce the, the newest appointee to the Superior Court, you know, uh, Judge Benjamin Reyes. And uh, um, you should have seen the look in the, uh, the young prosecutor's eyes uh, when, when that happened. So uh, I, you know, I, I share that story because it, you know, that, that happened just within the last three years. And there's still a lot of implicit bias um, that and and uh, and um, sort of assumptions that people make based upon either your ethnicity, the color of your skin, or you know where you sit. So uh, it's 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 something that I, I believe that we um, as a profession organization, and especially as bench officers and practitioners, need to address on a daily basis. I I don't know if if, if sometimes when things happen, if it's because I'm a woman or I'm a Filipina or I'm Asian or what exactly it is because you know you just don't know but it's something that was difficult in private practice um, was I you know I was a litigator big firm bet the company cases and you know you got the real sense and sometimes people said it to your face you know I'm looking for the biggest meanest SOB to, to do battle and vanquish my enemy and, you know, how in the world are you going to do that? And it, you know, it's very frustrating because there you sit in your high heels with your little handbag and skirt. And, you know, you're trying to persuade somebody that you can do something that isn't sort of the right picture of what they really need. Um, and that was my anecdote. Um, so, uh, this, uh, uh, when I was a lawyer, deputy attorney general, so a prosecutor, appearing in Orange County Superior Court, uh, the uh, lawyer on the other side was a, a, um, a man who at the time I thought was old, but maybe he was in his 60s. That's not so old. <laughs> and, uh, he was a, a very well-known Orange County criminal defense lawyer. And uh, 
he uh, he patronized me a lot, but uh, probably without understanding that's what he was doing. And I still remember we were in court and we we're uh, in front of the uh, judge and we we're getting ready for a jury trial. And so he, he turns and looks over to me and says, you, uh, you know, Lillian, uh, I always wear a brown suit because uh, that is a color that will uh, evoke uh, uh, or send the message of sincerity to the jury. <laughs> and I, uh, I look back at him and our judge happened to be a, uh, um, a Mexican American, uh, Hispanic judge. And I look back at this lawyer and I said, well, I was born brown, so I was born sincere. <laughs> so I, I just share that little story. And like Judge Schofield said, you know, when I came to the bench, I was young, probably too young. I was like 34. Uh, I was a woman. I was a woman of color. I was a Filipino. Uh, and I was also physically of very small stature. And I think for uh, many of the colleagues, my colleagues, or at the time, they're kind of like, where did she come from? And does she deserve to be here? And, uh, and uh, regretfully, maybe uh, some still felt that way uh, when I uh, left the bench, questioned uh, my uh, right to be there. Uh, but uh, 22 years later, I was found to be the uh, uh, judge of the year by the county bar. So at least they recognized uh, that uh, someone like me could be a good judge. And, you know, I have to say it, it's a testament to the, the, the people on this panel and the other uh, Filipinos that come before us in the country. I, I can't honestly say I have a story where I think I've been discriminated because of my Filipino background in the legal profession. So I think, uh, and obviously I'm not saying that we're, we're there, but I just think that a lot of the people, uh, like the panelists here have, have broken a lot of barriers and it made it easier for people like me. Thanks for sharing those stories. And all too often I hear from even law students and new lawyers that they get mistaken for court reporters or interpreters or secretaries. And it, we just show them that you can't uh, underestimate your opponent because we always kick their butt. So that's, uh, that's what this panel has shown. Um, do any of you feel the pressure of being the first? So you are all trailblazers in your right. And do, is there any extra pressure because you're the first blank Filipino American judge in the history of the United States? I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that. I, um, because this question was specifically addressed at me during um, an interview with uh, Ramon Conclara at uh, abs -CBN. And uh, um, he asked me that specific question. So I, and, and the way I answered is I, I, I do feel the weight of the community on my shoulders. And I know that not only um, is everyone in the legal community observing me uh, because I, I look a little bit different, um, but I also know that I probably will be receiving special scrutiny from the Filipino American community and the API community. And because of that, I'm always mindful that all of my actions uh, need to be a reflection of who I am as a person they need to be a reflection of my family values, the training that I received at my law school, uh, the uh, organization that uh, I uh, am proud to be a member of, FBank, and also my community. And, and therefore, I need to conduct myself professionally every day to have integrity beyond reproach and to afford everyone who comes into my courtroom with dignity and respect. Because my, uh, I realize that I'm standing on the shoulders of the people who did come before me, Judge Peter Chai, Judge Nisperos, um, all the people in F Bank who supported uh, my appointment. And I also need to set an example for the people who wish to come after me. Just like uh, um, our Vice President, Kamala Harris, um, while I am the, um, one of the first 
uh, trial judges in uh, the Bay Area, at least the first one in 35 years. I certainly don't want to be the last, and I'm glad that we're now joined by uh, you know, Judge Audrey Barra and Judge Johnny Gogo here in the Bay Area. But I, I certainly would want to encourage um, many more uh, people to come after us, and I, I hope that I can um, help uh, uh, the path uh, become easier for those who uh, wish to come after me. I would have a similar answer. I, I, I don't feel pressure, but I, I would say this, that I'm extremely thankful uh, for, the, for the opportunity to, to serve. And uh, what, what it, what, how that manifested to me is that I wanted, uh, you know, David, you mentioned that I, I sworn in a lot of members and I wanna continue doing that. What, what I wanna do is just show and inspire other uh, younger Filipino lawyers that we can be the judges, the prosecutors and every role and so uh, I want to do as much of these community events as, as, as physically possible. And so that's why, unless I have a conflict or, or argument, if ever I get an invitation, I, I, I say yes. And so that's, that's what I think of as pressure, but I think that's a good, great pressure. I, I think that's a good segue to get to sort of our final question for you, and then we'll open it up with the remaining minutes for Q&A. Uh, what do you hope for the Filipino American legal community in the future? So, let, let me just start by saying that I'm so proud of Fallon, New York for some of the things that they have done in the community here and specifically um, working to help educate the Filipino community members about their rights, about the law, about issues pertinent to the election. That, and that I think is such important work that serves the Filipino community. But what I would love to see as the next step is for Filipinos to become more of a powerful and political force in the community at large and not just the Filipino community. I think you folks in California are kind of way ahead of us in that area. Um, but I see real movement in that direction here on the East Coast. And I think that's the next step. I'll, I'll add my two cents here. I, I would love to see uh, more Filipino Americans and people uh, from the API community in general occupy uh, the offices of general counsel um, amongst Fortune 500 corporations in uh, governmental agencies, um, obviously on the bench, and uh, as uh, you know, chief prosecutors, district attorneys, or uh, the uh, the public defender of their particular county. I um, I, I believe that there is um, a lot of uh, opportunity there. We just uh, need to uh, encourage it. Um, I'm looking here at the chat message and I see um, our, our good friend Eddie Angelis uh, states that uh, um, presumably he would like to see a, a person of Filipino heritage on the United States Supreme Court. So that would be a good aspirational goal. Uh, that's great. Well, Thank you so much. I think at this point we can open it up for a question or two. Natalie, do we have any? Um, yeah, we have one question. I think we can um, squeeze it in. Um, um, what advice do you have for older law student, an older law student pursuing a second career and an aspiring attorney and maybe even a, to becoming an aspiring attorney and maybe even the bench one day? Is it ever too late? Judge Lim? Well, one, it's never too late. And I would say to whoever asked that question uh, and others, uh, don't be shy. Uh, you may think uh, judges, officials, leaders of the bar associations are isolated from you, but uh, uh, they're not. And certainly I, I wasn't as a judge and, and uh, 
And that's why I still have uh, what I consider lifelong friendships with the people who are not shy uh, to talk to me, like Natalie and uh, her sister, Valerie, and uh, all my Hanai nephews, Marty Lorenzo, uh, uh, Joanne Joby. Uh, it's, uh, I think everyone here uh, and uh, other people uh, who may be fulfilling leadership roles, they welcome you to contact them. So don't be shy. And I think our time is up. Um, on behalf of FBank's Professional Development Committee and my co-director Janice Reger, thank you to our judges today and our moderator for sharing your journey and experience on the bench. And thank you to our sponsors, the Dolan Law Firm and Varela Brent Braun and Martin. Um, if you'd like to obtain CLE credit, please see the information in the chat. And again, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, your honors. Aloha. Yep. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And all of Judge Lim's family that, is, that came as well. <laughs> <laughs>